Hello, I'm Dr. Derek Keats, a former professor of biology, and I'm still here with you talking about the human endocrine system. This time, we're going to look at the pancreas and the important role it plays in regulating our blood sugar, as well as some of its other functions, its non-endocrine functions. Remember from the first video that some of the components of the endocrine system are found within the alimentary system, and the pancreas is one of these. Surrounding the pancreas is, of course, the stomach, the gallbladder, the duodenum, and of course, in this picture, is the pancreas itself. There is a common duct with the gallbladder, and the pancreas has its own duct called the pancreatic duct. The pancreas is both an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. In its endocrine function, it produces several important hormones, including insulin, glucagon, somatostatin, and pancreatic polypeptide. And in its exocrine function, it is a digestive organ secreting alkaline pancreatic juice that contains digestive enzymes that assist in the absorption of nutrients, the control of pH, and with digestion, all happening in the small intestine. Note that the very acidic mixture of partially digested food and digestive juices that is passed into the intestine from the stomach is called chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. The enzymes in the pancreatic juice help to further break down the carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids in the chyme that passes back from the stomach. Given its acidic nature, it is important that the alkaline nature of the pancreatic juice helps neutralize the stomach acids that arrive in this chyme. Most of the mass of the pancreas is in fact exocrine tissue and associated ducts. Now let's look at these hormones briefly and see what each of them do. Starting with insulin. Insulin, together with glucagon, is central to the regulation of carbohydrate and fat metabolism within the body. In particular, Insulin decreases glucose concentration and helps keep it at constant levels within the blood. Glucagon, on the other hand, raises blood glucose levels, having thus the opposite effect to that of insulin. Somatostatin plays a role in the overall endocrine regulation, including affecting growth and neurotransmission. And pancreatic polypeptide, which we won't see again uh, in this video, is involved in the self-regulation of, pan of the pancreatic endocrine and digestive secretion activities. Now the part of the pancreas with endocrine function is made up of about a million cell clusters called islets of Langerhans, singular islet. As shown in this microscope image of a single islet, they are more or less spherical clusters of cells, each islet measuring only 0.2 millimeters in diameter. The combined mass of the islets is only 1 to 1.5 grams, or 1 to 2 percent of the mass of the pancreas. Despite the small size and small mass, the islets of Langerhans provide a very important function to our bodies. Hormones produced in the islets of Langerhans are secreted directly into the blood flow by at least five types of cells, of which we can mention four here. Alpha cells produce glucagon, and glucagon is stained red in the micrograph. Beta cells produce insulin and amylin, which make up the bulk of the cells, up to 80% by mass. Insulin is stained green in this uh, micrograph, and as you can see, it dominates the field of view. Delta cells produce somatostatin, and PP cells produce pancreatic polypeptide. In case you're wondering, the bluish-purple color here are the nuclei of the individual cells that make up the islet. Incidentally, the islets were discovered in 1869 by a German pathological an anatomist named Paul Langerhans, who was only 22 at the time. And as an aside, he later made a major contribution to my own field of marine biology, having spent a bit of his, quite a bit of his time working on marine worms. The other type of cells in the pancreas form structures called axini, 
The singular is axinus. Digestive enzymes are secreted into the lumen of the axinus and then accumulate from the axini in ducts that drain into the main pan pancreatic duct, which in turn drains directly into the duodenum. We're not going to come back to these in this video. Now, imagine you. Imagine eating. Imagine eating a heavy plate of food like this, or even something a bit healthier. Think of what is in that food. Carbohydrates, proteins, fats, salts, fiber, and even toxins. Have you ever thought about how your body deals with all of this intake? If you ate a meal like this with so many carbohydrates and you had no means at all to control the glucose in your blood, it would reach toxic levels and eventually this would kill you. That's where our friend the pancreas comes in. And the tissues of the pancreas that, it, that are important here are those that comprise the islets of Langerhans. Now remember that the islets of Langerhans produce insulin, and insulin is a peptide hormone composed of 51 amino acids. This is true in humans, but the structure of insulin varies a bit among different species of animals. Now here is something you could do. Can you remember what is a peptide? You should review that. If you can't remember what a peptide is, you should pause the video and do a bit of googling to find out, but not too much googling, just a little bit. Insulin causes cells in the liver and muscle tissue to take up glucose from the blood, storing it as glycogen, a starch-like molecule, as you may recall, <clears throat> inside these tissues. It promotes the absorption of glucose into the cells for use as an energy source for cellular respiration. Insulin also stops the use of fats as an energy source by inhibiting the release of glucagon. Insulin provides, is provided within the body in a constant proportion to remove excess glucose from the blood. Of course, the glucose that is converted into glycogen can be converted back to glucose when it is needed if the blood glucose levels fall below a certain normal level. Insulin has other functions in the body as well, but we're not going to cover them here. You may wish to explore this further on the internet or in your own reading. Now let us look at another pancreatic hormone, glucagon. Like insulin, glucagon is a peptide hormone secreted by the pancreas. It causes the liver to convert stored gly glycogen into glucose, which is essential to the bloodstream. Glucagon thus promotes the release of glucose into the bloodstream when levels fall below optimum. Glucagon and insulin are part of the feedback system that keeps blood glucose levels at stable level. Now let us compare and contrast insulin and glucagon, the two, polypep the two polypeptide hormones that are involved in regulating blood sugar. They're part of a feedback system that keeps your blood gl glucose at stable levels. Insulin is secreted by the beta cells when blood glucose levels are too high. Glucagon is secreted by alpha cells when blood glucose levels are too low. It's important to remember that these alpha and beta cells are within the islets of Langerhans. Insulin stimulates the uptake of blood glucose for use in cellular respiration, as well as for storage in the liver, muscle, and to some degree fat tissue. Glucagon stimulates the re release of stored glucose, mainly from glycogen in the liver, to increase the blood glucose levels and make energy available to the body and its tissues. Now let us look at this feedback loop from the perspective of glucose and the hormone levels in the blood. The pink line shows the normal levels of glucose and the baseline levels of insulin and gluc glucagon. Let's take some turns of the loop and see what happens. Imagine you. Imagine you eat something, say a banana, on an empty stomach at break time after you've been in class all morning. You do eat fruit, not chips and chocolate, I hope. As the food is digested, the glucose levels in the blood may rise. Insulin is then released into the blood, raising its levels. This causes the glucose to be taken up and stored and brings the concentration of blood glu glucose levels back to normal. And then the insulin level drops back to its normal base level as well. Later, when the food is all gone and the levels of glucose may drop in the blood, glucagon is released and, gl and glycogen is mobilized into glucose, released from the liver, thus raising the glucose levels back up to normal, 
and the glucagon falls back to its normal baseline level. Looking at this feedback loop that controls blood sugar levels, we can see that it is absolutely vital to the functioning of our bodies. What happens when this feedback loop fails because a part of it ceases to function? Let's take insulin. If its effectiveness is reduced, or it's not produced at all, then we have a condition known as diabetes mellitus, or just diabetes. There are two main types of diabetes, referred to as type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes results from the body's failure to produce insulin, and presently this requires a person to inject insulin in order to survive. It's, you, type 1 diabetes usually manifests itself during childhood, but it can also manifest in adults, although this is much rarer. Type 2 diabetes involves insulin resistance of sorts. Cells fail to use insulin properly. Beta cells are not able to increase secretion of insulin to overcome this resistance, and this is sometimes combined with a deficiency of insulin production as well, which just exacerbates the problem. This type of diabetes usually manifests itself in adulthood, often around middle age. There is a third type of diabetes called gestational diabetes. This occurs in pregnant women who have never had diabetes before and causes a high level of blood glucose during pregnancy. If it is treated properly, it usually goes away after birth of the child, but if it is not treated, it can, in it can endanger both the fetus and the mother. <clears throat> a few more things that you should note about diabetes mellitus. Types 1 and 2 diabetes are chronic conditions, that is, you have them for life. They can't be cured, only treated. 285 million people have type 2 diabetes as of 2010, which means that this type of diabetes accounts for 90% of all diabetes cases. Both types of diabetes have been treatable since insulin became available in the early 1920s, and more recently with the production of synthetic insulin analogs. Type 2 diabetes can be controlled by diet or diet in combination with medications such as the drug metformin. Now we've pretty much covered <clears throat> what you need to know for the South African Grade 12 Life Sciences Syllabus on this subject. If you want to take it further and have a deeper understanding, you could search Google or another search engine using terms such as pancreas, islets of Langerhans, insulin, glucagon, diabetes, or any of the other words that we've used in this video. You can also look for videos on YouTube and other online sources of video material. You could even visit the local school library or the local library and read up on, the, on such topics there. I love libraries and I'd go there. If you want to get creative, you can interview a family member, a family friend or acquaintance who has diabetes. If you ask their permission first, you could even record the interview with your cell phone, either as audio alone or with video if your phone has that capability. You can again, with permission, upload the video into your e-learning system, that's if your teacher allows it, and share it with your teacher and with fellow learners. And that's all for now. I'm Derek Keats, and this resource is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution License. Bye for now.